rate was a UAC, because it was a UAC that comes into the calculation for the rates cap of 30% for UAGC, so by putting that rate in, it changed the UAGC and it changed the general rate. And at the time of adopting the rates resolution, we didn't actually know what those rates in the dollar or the UAGC was going to be. Um, so that left us um, in a bit of doubt of where that rates resolution actually stood. Um, so we took some legal advice on that, um, and to be absolutely uh, sure, we need to adopt it again. So we'll be coming back on the 30th of August to adopt the rates resolution with the same intention as what Council did intend, um, but it'll ha actually have the rates figures in it, and that still gives us time to get the rates out, um, so it doesn't hold that up, and we can ensure that we legally comply. So there was some doubt about whether it would that, that, that perhaps the lesson to be learned here is that staff need to give you, uh, give councillors um, the opportunity to see final documents at, at, at a meeting, to be considered at a meeting before the meeting to adopt. So, so the, the issue is that we didn't give you time to make changes and, and be able to do it on the day and actually deal with it. So that's a lesson that uh, we've learned. So that in the future, when you get a, these documents, they'll come to you in a final form at a meeting that you still will have the opportunity to change, but not adopt. So, so at the meeting, when you do adopt, there is no change to them. Thank you, Paul. Are there any other questions about this reach? No? We've got a motion there. Do we've got a mover and a seconder? I'll move the recommendation that Council notes the breach of the debt hedging compliance at 30 June 2020. We've got a, thank you. Councillor, got a second of that? Yeah. I'll, I'll second it, but I just um, ask the question, does that going to give us a black mark with our auditor? Uh, Mr Chairman, no it won't. The, uh, perhaps I've written this a little bit unclearly. The breach is actually going to happen in about 2025, or we're doing a signalling that at the moment, if we stay where we are, our projection we're going to be outside by a very small amount. It's a tiny breach. This is not one that the auditor is actually um, really concerned about as long as we've addressed it. It comes about because we quarterly measure this measure, but in the interim we've taken up other debt, either fixed or floating, and depending on the terms of that debt, it actually affects out where you sit in this measure. Um, usually when it's we take um, ex forward exchange or forward swaps to, to uh, fix this. Um, because we've got some debt that we're going to be raising shortly, we can fix it through the terms of the debt that we pick up. So the recommendation was not to take a swap out at this moment, but just accept that we've got a minor breach go that's going to happen in 2025, but we'll, we'll make sure we don't breach it. Thank you for that, Paul. We've got a move in the seconder. Everyone in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. I have to make an apology. I didn't welcome Murray Harrington at all. <laughs> good day, Harrington. Murray, um, good to see you. You were quite quiet, but I hope you can hear us. And I hope we can hear you. I can hear you, yes. And we can hear you too. So, thank you. Uh, for the people who don't know, Murray Harrington is the, ex is, is the ex external member of our committee. Point five, the Ashburton Hospital Helipad. Helipad. And for, the, for that one, I welcome Matt Bullcock, who will speak to us, James, and who else? Tania is coming up, I think. Welcome, Matt. We've seen each other before when you spoke to the, at, the, at the airport to the committee there. Um, Please explain to the committee here and the councillors and everyone else what exactly you want to do and for what reasons. Yep, um, so what we'd like to do is um, make a IFR approach into the Ashburton Hospital. So uh, at the moment uh, we just basically fly visually and at night we use night vision goggles. Uh, IFR refers to flying by instruments, so what uh, airlines do more or less. Uh, we've been starting to adopt uh, this procedure. Uh, Helicopters Otago have been doing it down Southland, various hospitals such as Alexandra and that. 
and the big advantage is we can get in and out in uh, lower cloud uh, ceilings, especially at night time is our big restriction. Um, it's also difficult to get in and out of Christchurch, more to the point at uh, due to restricted cloud ceilings, and it can be often better in Ashburton and Timaru than it is in Christchurch. So that's kind of the, the reasoning behind it, to be more operational, operationally capable, um, especially at night. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Are there any questions? Paul, uh, James, you want to speak now, or do we've got questions for Matt first? Anyone, any questions? Carolyn. Me? Uh, yeah, I've just got a few questions like r with regards, I read the report and I couldn't see any, the incidents, like how many times would have you cancelled flights to Ashburton to, um, and how often would you, do you think you'd use the instrument flight um, navigation system yeah. annually sort of thing? Yeah, it's, it's a metric that we always wish that we tracked better because it's, it's hard to know. Sometimes we turn the, turn the job down because the weather's no good in, in Christchurch, but we weren't sure what it is here. But we estimate it to be kind of 10 to 20% of our jobs uh, turned down due to weather, and quite a large proportion of those could be done um, by the instrument flight rules. Can I something? What is that like? How many jobs do you do a year then? I'm going to work. I just uh, well, want to know how many Christchurch, months. around 500 jobs a year. So yeah. to Ashburton, you don't actually oh, know. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, sorry, I should have. I've got that data for last year, which I can get you. Is it one a I month? Think, or, or I think there was around 80 jobs, 60 to 80 jobs last year to Ashburton, um, but I'm not sure how many were turned out. In sorry. total, yes. And, so, and a proportion of those, 10 to 20%, were cancelled because yes. of weather inclement, yeah. you know, weather. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So six to yeah, six yep. cases. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. It's not a question. Just coming back to the recommendation, I note in the summary there that Southern Lakes Helicopters is included uh, for the LFR type of thing, but they're not included in the actual recommendation. Is there in, any reason why um, Southern Lakes Helicopters yeah. are yeah, left yeah. out? Yeah, well, ba us. basically Southern Lakes... Uh, aren't and probably won't be looking at instrument flight rules procedures, but we want to include them to allow them access to the helipad if they are up this way, basically. So it's pretty much um, GTH Aviation Heli Otago that will be um, operating uh, by instrument rules, so I guess that is the reason. But we, we include all rescue uh, helicopter operators in the South Island. Thank you, Matt. Mr Mayor. Yeah, thanks, Mr Chairman. So when the... Um, report gets to council. Can we have a bit more clarity on the trees that need to be trimmed, James? It says there's several trees on water to have three metres. Didn't say where they are, what they are. Trimming trees in any district is fought with difficulty at times. So we just did a bit of clarification around that. And the other question I have is the four kilometre UAV restriction. So, and what does that mean for other people? Um, I'm, and I'm thinking now of people who fly their drones. Um, for um, whatever reason they fly them for, would that stop that behaviour or stop that activity or not? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll ask answer the second question first. So, the four kilometre drone restriction, um, it won't prohibit the flight of drones, but there will be requirements on the drone that the people that fly the drones uh, for commercial. They will. Um, the drone pilots will have to be um, certified licensed. They will have to um, file a flight plan through Airshare, um, and that will generate a, a request. That they'll have to then put a request through to both the um, helipad operator, which is Ashburton Hospital, and if it's a crossover between that and the uh, airfield. Um, for Ashburton Airport, they'll have to um, consult with both those um, operators to get permission to do the flight. Um, and then a NOTAM, which is a notice to airmen, will um, be produced. Only needs one NOTAM. So one between the two organisations, one will agree to do, do the NOTAM. When the helicopter does its pre-flight as part of the flight planning, they'll pick up the NOTAM that there's a notification for flight of, an, uh, of a drone and the area they'll be operating and the height that'll be operating at. 
for your smaller personal drones um, if they operate under what's called shielded operations and that's within the report. So basically staying below a tree line or keeping a building or another barrier between that and the airfield. Um, that is a permitted activity except for what we're saying with this report is because of the final approach into the helipad they wouldn't be able to use shielded operations because you, um, you've got no barriers on that last pivot across the domain sports field. Thank you for that. Sarah, you want to say? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and so, just on the oh, oh, with the first question in regards to the trees, uh, uh, Garden City Helicopters will be uh, conducting a survey of those trees, and Matt will answer that because there's some additional information on that. Yeah, so we've we've struck this on uh, pretty much every hospital we've um, conducted this into because there's trees everywhere. And uh, we, we did trim some trees in Kaikoura, but they were pretty small. Um, we've had this problem in um, Tekapo, uh, sorry, Twizel. And so we've gone back to the designers of the approach and we've managed to modify our last section so we don't have to trim the trees. So we're hoping we can do the same in Ashburton. We, we don't want to... The, the trees aren't a hazard to the type of flight profile we're doing. Unfortunately, the way the approaches are designed, they're actually designed for a fixed wing and it goes right back to AKO with the design. So so designs, uh, the procedures far outdate the, uh, are more modern than the design of the approach. So we are hoping that we won't need to trim any of the trees. And if we do, it, it won't be all of them. It, there's just a, a few that are quite tall through there. But once we conduct a drone survey, then we will, we will know what the exact heights they are. Thank you, Matt. Sarah? Yeah, through you, Mr Chair, just to um, further um, expand upon what James um, has commented on. In terms of point six with regards to drones, um, that is the area, there's a diagram under point six, a map of the Ashburton. That blue area is the current area that's already <coughs> impacted by having an airport close to town. So in terms of drone flying, personal drone flying, within that whole area there, um, shielded operations are the only way you'll need to um, conduct drone flying, unless you've got permission, as James has alluded to. So it is not um, a new thing, um, but as <coughs> what 10 shows you, there's an additional map which shows the extra area, with the red being the existing um, area, um, and the yellow then needing the bit to the left um, also covered by this rule of shielded operations. Um, so the, the key point in terms of what somebody couldn't do in the future if this um, helipad gets designated is literally drone flying on the approach in and out um, of, of the domain. So, so that's the, the key change. Um, and also the additional yellow area that's just an extension of what is um, currently um, required because of having an airport close by. So, um, yeah, it's not... Yeah, significantly different than a large portion of our local area already, but it enables uh, clearly the flights to come in by that different method. Thank you, Sarah. Just before I go to the next councillor, Matt, you're flying in now already, don't you? Yes. So do you've got any trouble with the trees? Or uh, is there a different no, reason? No, we, we fly a different flight path in and out at the moment. We, okay. We kind of, yeah, we... we Kind of fly down the main street of town and then turn and come in. Okay, um, so this. Yeah, this so this is a slightly different okay. um, layer. Thank you. Councillor Cameron. Uh, thank you. Um, I was concerned with when I look at the drone coverage, like the whole of the town is covered by the drone. And there are, you know, drones, and I'm no IT whiz, but I imagine in the future drones will become more and more useful commercially and also privately. and you know, we recently had the COVID crisis where drones could have been used to carry medicines in and out or um, floods and all that sort of thing or taking photographs. So drones have a, have a use. And it's also, so I think that's an important consideration. Um, I understand you can get permission to fly your drone, but it, it's a, for ind private individuals, that's tricky. Um, and the hospital helipad, point 11, the hospital helipad will be operated by Ashburton Hospital. And any request for drone flights within the helipad restricted no-fly zone will be approved by them. I'm just wondering how, is that going to be a lengthy process to get that approval or what's going to happen out of hours if that approval is required? Or? 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just explain why we um, went with the hospital being the uh, helipad operator. The the taskings of helicopters in and out of the helipad is actually um, through the medical requirement. So if we had the, it's better to sit the actual request through the through the hospital because they're the ones that are requesting the helicopter flights into the helipad. Um, if we had the um, requests uh, for the drone flights coming through council, then anything out of hours um, would actually be slower on a response than it would do if it was going through the, the hospital. Um, well, I hope, does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it does answer the question, but not in a satisfactory way. <laughs> And the, and the other point is, um, I was going to say, is the helipad, we're very careful in this report to mention that the helipad is only to be used for emergency helicopters and cannot be used for private helicopters or other people that would use a helipad. Um, is that the intention of that as well, to restrict use access to the helipad? Yeah. I agree, Mr Chair, yes, that's correct. We only want the helipad to be um, used by um, uh, medical emergency helicopters. It is called the hospital, hospital helipad. As it has <laughs> been. Next one, Councillor Rawson. Thank you. Councillor my question is around the, the drone usage. As you were speaking, it made me think, I'm a wedding celebrant, and at weddings often the, the photographers have got a drone just flying across the top. So if people are in the domain or up at trots mm -hmm. for a wedding and they want to have a drone footage taken, would that affect... Would they be meant to get permission to have their drone in usage? It's not very high as a rule, but it just crossed my mind that those are places quite close to there where the drone could be in the air. Uh, through through can you, I, can I just call to Sarah? Oh, so we might be saying the same thing through you, um, Mr yeah. Chair. Um, I'd just like to point to the picture on um, pay, uh, point seven, mm -hmm. um, where it says that you are allowed shielded operations mean you can still use drones. You just can't go higher than an object, which could be a big tree or a big house or anything, um, higher than that, within 100 metres of the house. Helipad. Okay, so there's a helicopter will not want to be hitting into a house or a tree, um, clearly. So there is a shielded operation area where you can fly without needing any permission. Cool. Thank so you. The, the common day usage will not be stopped right. by you. this. I just want to go to Murray. Murray, you've got any questions or... Concerns, or are you quite happy? Not on this subject, no. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Chairman. I'm not completely clear about, Sarah just said, a normal drone operation doesn't have to be shielded outside the area. This yellow is way over the other side of the Ashburton River. Most people with drones are conscious of airports because they understand there's aeroplanes coming in quite regularly. This site at the helipad will only be used occasionally, we hope, but to restrict drones way over the other side of the Ashburton, people are not going to understand. Why on earth are you doing that? Because we're miles away. Can the helicopter not have a passageway in that is exclusive for you and drones are excluded rather than such a great blanket area? Um, yeah, the, the rule was set up by um, the regulator to basically put a 4K radius around and it, it was initially designed in the airport and that's why it's an elongated um, circle around Ashburton Aerodrome because it goes from the, the, the runway threshold so that's why it's large. And um, the, the, the fact that it's, the fact that the, the zone is there around the hospital isn't going to you know, prevent people from operating. They just need to make a notification. And uh, if someone was operating right down by the uh, the river, it wouldn't pose a hazard. We, we just need to know what's happening. So we're not going to say, no, you can't do that. They just need to go through the process and make a notification. And the majority of the time, we're going to be utilising this approach for night operations. So it's, it's very, very rare that we cannot get in during the day um, so the, having a, basically for us to say, no, you can't use your drone is going to be very rare because hopefully no one will want to be using it at night time, I would imagine. So. Councillor Cameron. 
um, just two questions if yes. I may, quick ones. Um, publishing in the AJP that that instigates the 4K parameter, doesn't it? Yeah. If you were doing just your instrumental navigation, you don't need that 4K drone exclusion area. Um, <clears throat> well, yes and no. For for planning, uh, it is far easier um, to plan to yeah. to a designated spot. And I guess when we first looked at um, implementing this across the South Island, so we've done this in Kaikoura, um, hopefully Ashburton, Timaru and Twizel, we kind of looked at the risk profile as well. Mm. And uh, nearly all of our helipads, especially in the South Island, have no protection at all. So anyone can be flying the drone around the airport and we come in an emergency situation, which is often in inclement weather, and you don't have, and, and a lot of people are operating drones now. Yeah, so we, we really, you know, if, if we weren't even looking at IFR operations, I would be pushing that the uh, helipad was published in, in, the, in the AIPs um, for our protection. It also protects uh, the council for itinerants coming in and out of the pad because you're restricted only to emergency services. Under the NASO contract, we've got to all run twin engine helicopters. So. If we had an engine failure on approach, we wouldn't pose hazard to persons or public, whereas a commercial operator potentially could. So there's kind of there's many reasons why we want it published, but unfortunately the 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 only problem is there will be a restriction for people to notify the OPF. Last question, and then we go to okay, uh, uh, just, We're only talking about drones. What about big balloons? You know, we've got big balloon manufacturers in Ashford that do huge, high, big balloons. What about that sort of thing? Or is it only drones that we have to no notify? What about other things flying in the sky? Uh, that's actually a good question. I'm, I'm unsure, but I would imagine they would uh, do... Well, depends where they launch them from. If you launch it from the airfield, you wouldn't actually... Sort of Argyle Parkway, I think, and all, yeah, yeah. you know, big parks. I, don't know. Yeah. I mean, they're the massive sort of balloons. Yeah. I'm, I'm unsure. Kites, kites, yeah, kites, yeah. Oh, kites? Yeah. There's nothing stopping anyone to fly a kite, which, which again is, is some of our concerns about mm. having a park mm. right next to the helipad there. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. We had some good questions and some good answers. Page 25, we've got a recommendation to council. Do I've got a mover and a seconder for that? Council Cameron, are you moving that? Oh, well, um, I'm looking for a mover and a seconder for the motion. Page 25. Councillor Falloon is moving it. Is there a seconder? I'm happy to second that. And Mc Councillor McMillan is the seconder. We've got a mover and a seconder. Everyone in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. I didn't hear many ayes, so we start again. I'm pretty sure we had enough, but everyone in favour, please say aye. Aye. Okay, against. Not enough. So we've got two against, everyone in favour. Is there everyone else? Yeah, would be. I don't know if it's that would be nice to do it in two parts. We can do that, okay. Now the mover and the second from the first part, quite happy to start it in two parts. You both are? Aye. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Point one. Grant appro grants approval for GCH aviation and helicopters Otago to implement IFR approach operation to Ashburton Hospital Helipad. <coughs> Everyone in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Fully supported. Number two. Are you moving in the second? Are still happy to yeah. move and second that? Okay. The second part is authorizes the helipads be published in the New Zealand AIP as an established pad. Everyone in favour, please say Before, we, before we put okay. the motion, could I just have a yes, you can. question? Or what would be the outcome of not passing this and passing the first? Let's ask the people on the other side. Matt, can you answer that? Uh, it makes it difficult for planning for airways, and I, I think it's in best interest because it protects the park. So it, it's, it's for us, it's for a safety point of view. Is, is my 
protection. Could I ask you a question as well? So if you don't pass this, it might be happening that you can't be here because you don't have the fly path? Well, it, it could give us delays. It, yeah, it would be. I, I can I can research what the, the ramifications are, but I believe it's it's to do with the safety. I just called to Sarah if I can. Yeah, through the chair, um, just to mention a point that was um, said earlier. If we don't um, designate it by this process, any helicopter operator could use this. Yeah. So you could have a helicopter parked up at the time where we need to have an emergency, emergency flight landing. Um, so there's nothing uh, stopping us then from doing that. So hence why we do want to go to this next step to, to limit the people that can use it um, by doing this process. Yeah, I, I'm just sensing Coffee. a little bit of unease around the table about this, um, this particular um, recommendation. So when it passes today, when it gets to council, I think there might be a debate Perhaps a little bit more information around this side of it for full council. There's just a little yeah. doubt of there's this doubt on this piece, which may need some more detail when it gets to council. Yeah. But every helicopter in this district can land on the airport, isn't it? So they don't really have to be parking up next to the hospital. Sarah, you got any more to say or not? Um, no, well, I will, um, between us three, we will try and um, find the missing links of information that you require with our crystal balls and, um, yeah, put this forward if it passes to go to council. Okay. Murray, you've got a question on this? Murray, can you... No, I don't. No, you're not. No. Okay, thank you. No, no, no. Metal James, you have any... Um, I, I guess that I feel the big hesitation is a restriction of UAVs, but at the moment the whole park is restricted for UAVs anyway, so I don't see there's, it will really change or affect residents of Ashburton, um, because I would imagine that's probably where they'd want to fly their UAVs, so they would need to get permission and notify through the airport at the moment, so would that... Is this the biggest hesitation because of the restriction? Or? I'm not sure. How are we going to do this? Because we've got a second point two there. We can't, and we've got a put in the second there. So if that's passing as it is, Mr. Mayor, you still want to have an. If it passes, you want to have a report. Yeah, a little bit more in the report when it gets to council around that number too. So do you want to put it in the recommendation? No, I don't. So it's through you, Mr. Chairman. We, this is a recommendation to council. Yes. Yeah. We hear the debate, yeah. uh, and um, we, if this is passed, when it comes to council, we will endeavour to provide the additional information okay. that might give comfort to council to um, consider it. So you're quite comfortable if we pass this motion and we get extra information? Yeah, we're not entirely sure what additional information it is that's required, but we'll yeah. do our level best. Okay. Not happy on this table. Okay, we've got a motion on the table. Authorises the helipad to be published in the New Zealand AIP as an established pad. Everyone in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Passed. Thank you all. Thank you, James. Thank you, Matt. Good information. The next one is point seven, page. I've got a little 36. And that's the rate <coughs> remission policy. There's a recommendation in, on page 36. <coughs> Everything else behind there is following. I hope everyone read it. So are there any questions? Tony, you are in the hot seat there by yourself. I am, but I'll defer to those wiser than me if we're getting too, de too detailed. <laughs> <laughs> Councillors, are there any questions? Any questions? No. Oh, Murray. Murray, yep, go for it. It's probably my naivety, what is the process in terms of targeted consultation in this, in this matter? 
what does that process, how does that process get um, enacted or followed? What is the process for targeted consultation? Tony? Thank you, through the Chair. That's a great question. So this falls under Section 82 of the Local Government Act. And so by targeted consultation, um, sorry, I'll take a step back. So under the Local Government Act, you can do target, you could do um, Section 82 consultation or it is um, special consultative procedure. The special consultative procedure is far more prescribed and um, you have to do a minimum of four weeks consultation. This falls under the Section 82, which means that we can do a shorter consultation. We would be doing an online survey um, and giving people the availability to complete that uh, in hard copy if they needed. They wouldn't have the opportunity to come and speak to us at a hearing, um, and Council would simply deliberate on the results of that two-week consultation at the Council meeting. Thank you, Tony. Are you happy with that? <laughs> Murray? So sorry, I just missed who who gets the opportunity to fill the the uh, questionnaire out as people who are applying for this, or is it the general population? Who, who's targeted? That's a great question. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. It's open to anyone in the public. But what we would do is we we would make sure that uh, that. Uh, different groups in the community were directly contacted um, so that they knew that we had this short two-week consultation running. So we're thinking budget advisory groups, the social sector, um, MSD, those people that are in the know with um, understanding what might be happening in the community in terms of if there are redundancies that we aren't aware of so that they can give us a feel of if there is pressure coming on to people that may impact on their ability to pay rates. Okay. Yep, Thank you. Uh, Mary? Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Fulon. Yeah, one would presume before that targeted consultation started, there'd be ads in the local news media saying that we are having a consultation on how people are doing, can do it. Yes, absolutely. Um, it will be pretty quick, so we're going to have to make sure we get a wriggle on so that we can get information back to you for that council meeting in mid-August. Any more questions, councillors? If not, we go to the recommendation on page 36. There's a recommendation there to council. Do we have a mover as it stands? Councillor Wilson. Screen. Councillor Wilson, I did. Do I'll move top? that. And Councillor Brown is the seconder. We've got a mover in a second. You want to have to recommend. <laughs> you want to do it in one go. Recommendation is it stands. Okay. We've got a mover in a second. If you want to favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you all. This is the end of the open meeting. Um, thank you all for attending. Mr. Chair. Sorry. I was wondering whether we can move item 10 relating to Audit New Zealand from closed meeting to open meeting since the auditor is not going to be here and basically what we're just doing is looking at the audit engagement letter, the audit proposal and the audit plan and I think it would be useful as far as the um, public are concerned to understand the complexity to which uh, council officers yeah, have to prepare the financial oh, reports yeah, uh, for the ultimate report. Mm. Yeah. I just, Paul, you want to answer this question from Councillor Fulham? Um, just before the, oh, so before we go, I yeah. missed something. The financial variances uh, report, ladies, I missed something. So, so we've got another fifteen minutes for you. So um. I'm not sure how to answer that. The, Derek, the, the audit director, was going to be here to talk to these, and there is some matters in there that I think probably can come out, um, but I'd like to actually talk to him first and give him a heads up that they were going to come out rather than just release it um, straight out. So um, if, I, if we could just hold it in committee at the moment and I can talk to him about what comfortable that it all comes out. His understanding was it was going to be in committee. It may, if it was, he knew it was going to be 
an open meeting change it? I don't know. But I would normally give people, um, I suppose, advance warning that it was going to be considered at an open meeting. Um, I'm not sure that answers you or not, to be fair. <coughs> oh, Councillor Mackay. Uh, thank you for permission to ask a question as a non-committee member. Um, Mr Chair, is Councillor Falloon talking about item 10 on the main open agenda, or is he talking about item 10 actually in the body of the public excluded um, agenda? Yes. Because they are two totally different items, and I actually believe that if it's the one that's in the body of the PE report, that is totally irresponsible to move that to public because it's private rights of a protection of a natural person or company. You are correct, but we've got them both in public. No, I'm just excluded. asking the question. Yep. Um, which one are you talking about? Councillor Flynn, which one are you? Are you for both or? No, no, I'm talking about um, item 10 on the agenda, not the body, okay. body of the agenda yeah. where it's actually item, well, must be, uh, yeah, must be item 9. <laughs> I don't know. It's something to do with the, it's something to do with the makeup of the agenda, which has caused the confusion. Yeah, I think it is because that will be quite often and open, wouldn't it? That just the uh, just commenting on what Paul said before. Um, if the auditor was going to be here, mm. then I'd recommend that the, the meeting, the item, be held in committee because mm. I've got a list of questions here for the auditor, which I would not like to ask uh, with the public included. Yeah. But just for this is just, um, you know, the rigmarole we've got to go through to get the audit started. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a problem. Hamish, you can... Uh, I, I, I think I, I just want to underline Paul's advice and, and caution the committee that the, the matter was placed uh, into public excluded and the author of the report understood that. Uh, and um, we would really want to check in with our auditor rather than just deciding that the reasons don't exist. Uh, so um, we, we'll certainly look to do that, um, but debate on this item, uh, in my view, should remain public excluded. And if uh, we reach agreement with the author uh, that uh, there, there is um, no reason to keep it there, then we can certainly release the information to achieve what Councillor Flynn is seeking, i.e. understanding the complexity of the audit process, if that was your intention. But just to take it out of public excluded when the author wrote it, thinking it was uh, to be treated that way, um, I think would be um, a little unwise. Yeah. Murray, you want to make a comment? I actually didn't hear the question. Could you please re repeat the question so I can understand the conversation? John, or...? What's the way? Or Paul, you want to? The question, Murray, was whether the because Derek, the order director, can't be here. There are three in committee reports, effectively from the audit, and the question was whether they should be taken out of committee and considered now out of committee rather than stay in committee at the moment. That was really the the question. Sorry, I still don't. There was. Three items in the audit letter that were to be no. taken out of the committee. No, Is that no, the question? No, the question was whether all the, the planning letters should all oh, those see. letters be coming out of committee now or should they stay in committee? And the other issue I'd also remember too is that these letters weren't finalised uh, because they were given to us. We gave them, told them when the agenda cut off was and they promised it by five o'clock that day, but with the proviso that they actually hadn't been finalised. Um, it's not clear in the letter that that's the case, but that was the situation. Um, but yeah, it's the issue whether they stay in committee at the moment or whether they are all taken out. And if they're taken out, they're taken out without the audit director knowing that those letters or those arrangements are coming out. It's a bit hard when the audit director's not um, present, doesn't it? No. No, he's not here. No. I'll withdraw the request. 
You withdraw the request. Okay. So we leave it as it stands, and there we go. <clears throat> the final part for open, open committee is the fancy book. The financial for a variant report. And we just do page by page if we can. <clears throat> i get my horse back. A variant report. <clears throat> Wait till you've got it all have it in front of you. We go page by page and ask the questions. <coughs> page number two, income and expenditure. Page three, sorry, page five and six. Oh, no, hold on. Three and four, page per page is easier. Oh, sorry, yes. I've got a Wilson. question on page four around the capital income with the, where only I see 14% of total capital income, but is a lot of that delayed on the drawdown of loans and things because of COVID? And not just because of COVID, no. So the uh, capital income is all related to when we have capital expenditure. So if a project has not been um, completed and there is no requirement for a loan as of this date, mm. then a loan won't have been drawn for that project. And so that is what the income is for. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Fulham? Yeah, just on the same page, I note that our capital expenditure we've actually spent 36% of what's budgeted and we've got one month to go for the year, so we're certainly not going to spend 64% in one month. I just wonder, is this a budget problem or is it an annual plan versus LTP problem and, and why it arises to give this mismatch? Hamish? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and um, we talk about it most years. Across New Zealand, uh, infrastructure um, planning and capital expenditure tends to lag ambitions. So when we set the budget, we um, genuinely believe that this work uh, is valuable and can be done. Uh, and then we find uh, that our capacity to do the work within the 12 month period uh, is not as great as we had anticipated at the time of setting the budget. So right across New Zealand, uh, right across every council in New Zealand, uh, in many government departments, uh, capital expenditure uh, is difficult to achieve um, as per um, estimates and budgets. Uh, one of the, um, there are a variety of reasons for that, uh, and COVID didn't help. Uh, and planning in our case around the uh, CBD, where we had to amalgamate budgets and plans for uh, some of the pipe work from uh, other parts of the, the budget. And while we were working on, on all of that time um, ticked by, uh, con consents and, and design often takes longer than you, you, know, you would hope that it would at the time of starting a project. Um, so it, it's a continual source of frustration. We would, we would want to be able to do at the capital works that we um, agreed with the community that we were going to do via our planning. Uh, but um, right across the country, it is difficult to achieve. Uh, and this year, uh, it doesn't look flash. We certainly won't be spending the next 64% in the next month. The work, the work will not uh, be completed. And there are good reasons in specific cases. Uh, but the big picture, the strategic issue is that um, we, we seem to struggle to get it done most years. Thank you, Hamish. Councillors, if you just can speak in the microphone, because it's really hard for... Um, Murray to hear us if we don't speak in the mic. Huh? Councillor Cameron. Uh, just a really quick question on page three. Other revenue, which is 4.7 million, which is a lot. What is that other? <laughs> Through the chair, I would have to go back and actually dig into the report it's, too. It's quite a sizable amount. I mean, it's nearly, it's more than 10% of the rates revenue, so it's quite a sizable amount. I just wonder why it's under, there might be something significant in there that could have its own line. Just a thought. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. No. We tried to work it out for you, Councillor. <coughs> we go to page five and six. Six and se seven and eight. Nine and ten. Eleven, twelve. Mr. Mayor. Just on Stockwater operating expenditure, 260,000 unfavorable. Mm -hmm. um, it looks at um, the Craycroft intake is the problem. Did we spend 260,000 on Craycroft and we've now walked away from it? Uh, if you can clarify, what do you mean if we walked away from it? Well, we, we've shut the Craycroft in intake down. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we spend 260000 trying to keep it going, and then we decided, no, we won't. Yes, a lot of the expenditure uh, was in, in in fixing the damage that was done during the flood event. Um, but you're correct. We've, we've spent all that money, and now subsequently we, we're no longer using that intake. Murray, you still all right? Yep. Page 13 and 14. <coughs> 15 and 16. 17, 18. 19 and 20. 21, 22. 23, 24. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, Murray. Oh, sorry, Murray, yes. Well, I was just going to ask a question that's back to that perennial issue of the the capex in terms of forecasting and budgeting for next years, given the conversation that's just been had, yep. um, in terms of the the aspirational targets, but there's a dose of reality, and we've been in this COVID environment. Is there any um, thinking in terms of doing things differently or um, setting more realistic forecasts? Because these ones, at times, appear to be you know truly aspirational for good reason, but it sort of, in some respects, makes them a little bit unachievable and meaningless. Okay, thank you. Good question. Hamish will answer. Yeah, we, we don't actually um, endeavour or set out to set aspirational targets. We genuinely think that work is going to be done. It's not. It's not. It's not a aspirational target. It turns out to be that way in hindsight uh, because of the difficulties that we um, uh, re re referred to. Uh, I, we, we try really hard to plan only the work that we think we can get done. Um, but often life gets in the way and and you can you can think of an, a range of things that are in this report where you, you can read in terms of the explanation uh, that we uh, might want to rethink the design or we might think there's a better way of doing it than there was at the time of uh, planning and budgeting. Uh, and then that causes a rethink and a... Um, and a delay, and suddenly it doesn't it doesn't get done. And one of the things that uh, I like about that process is that we do continually um, try and deliver value for money. So the the sometimes rethinking the design is actually the right thing to do, but of course it 
clashes with getting your, your capex um, spent. Um, the next 12 months loom is even harder uh, around forecasting capex. Remember, the budget's already done. We've already adopted the budget. Um, uh, but we know in the three water space from the announcement just yesterday in, in relation to um, the government's reform um, program that there could be uh, some additional um, uh, money available uh, to this council should we um, choose to opt into that reform process that will be presumably for work that um, uh, we may not have anticipated getting done. And that might be extra work, but it might also take resources away from lower priority works that then at the end of the year we look back and we're unable to achieve. So, so we, will cont we, we talk about it a lot uh, at the executive level. Uh, we want to meet the planning um, commitments uh, uh, better than we currently do. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons that collide as to why CapEx is very hard to um, achieve exactly as per an annual plan. And remembering some of this work is really complicated, big work. You take the CBD, I mean, it, it, it straddles more than one financial year. Uh, once you've dug a hole, things underneath aren't what you expected. Um, you, could, you could have weather events as well as, in this case, COVID. There's, there's a massive number of reasons that collide with your ability to, um, to achieve it. We, we try hard. Uh, we want to do better. Uh, but um, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy thing. And as I say, and I think I said this 12 months ago, uh, the whole of New Zealand is in the same boat. This is not a, an issue that the Ashburton District Council has on its own. There is a lot of under, under expenditure and capital works uh, right across New Zealand and right across um, both local and central government. So there's a lot of things to solve to, to make it better in, in a meaningful way. You could hear the answer. Murray? Yeah, yeah I, I, I understand how complex it is. It's, it's just, um, it's, it must be hard for you especially to, to run in, in a business and get accountability when there's uh, so much variation and that's I guess from a management and a governance standpoint trying to understand how we get how we do that better is difficult um, given the answer that you've just given which I do understand. Um, yeah, yes I think that's right and I think that the role of this committee and council uh, and our obligation as um, uh, as employees is to continue to continue to have an accurate information flow to council. So in fact there are no, as much as we wish this number wasn't what it was, uh, there, there shouldn't be a councillor that's surprised by it uh, at this time of year because we've reported uh, all year on these issues, we've talked about the CBD redevelopment, um, uh, we've talked about the capital budgets that had to be pulled into that and the, and the timing of that. So all the way through in a governance sense um, the, 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 there's, there shouldn't be things in here where um, they're a, a surprise at all to elected members. Thank you, Amos. Thank you. Murray, are you happy with that? No, uh, thank you. Okay. Page 29 and 30. Councillor Fleur. I'll bet. Council officers are very pleased when the 15th of May 2021 comes round because we'll be looking at a saving of $450,000 on our interest bill. Thank you for that. 31.32. And the last pictures from 33 and 34. Oh, I may be reading it yes. incorrectly, but if, is there a, a bit of a, an issue at the three-month um, time frame on debtors? Rachel, you want to answer it? And, and can you expand on your question, Mary? In what way? Well, looking at one and two months, three months looks higher. Is there a collectability issue in the other debtors number? At the three month time frame, is that am I reading that correctly? I just so the, maybe I'm not the the three months page 33. Yeah, yeah, so that the three months is three months plus, 
So it's not just at that three-month mark. It's anything that's old and outstanding. It does tend to stick around a similar level. Um, and I think we are going to have to do more around our debt collection type of work um, to see whether we can get any of that back. And what's in that number? Is it rates, presumably, is a good portion unpaid rates, or is it other debtors? It's other debtors. The rates debtors are shown separately, so they are on yeah, the sorry, top. sorry, yeah. you're right. So uh, yeah, it just looks like quite a significant number compared to one and two. I was just wondering yeah. what you can do to get that money if it sits around that 300000 level. Um, so it's mainly just around tightening up our debt collection processes um, and probably referring a lot more of those debtors to debt collection when we have struggled to retrieve it ourselves. You're okay with it, Murray? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, as long as we're doing everything we can to collect the money, that's, uh, that's all we can do, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's taken care of from now on. Thank you. No. Mr. Mayor. How, how does that um, compare with previous month or months? Is it rising? Is it down? Or where is it at? The, the three months... In particular, so there yeah, on, on page 34 is the um, prior month comparative. In general, that older than three month debt for other debtors stays at around a similar level. Uh, so what's in there seems to be quite old or getting older. So, so sorry to be a pain, no. but what is that other debtors? What is it? Um, you know, or, it... I, I would be able to get a breakdown for you, but it's it's anything that we have raised um, charges for that's not a, not for rates in particular. So it, right. it could so be is for it a wide range. Parking fines and things like that, is it, it? Yeah, it could be parking fines. It could be um, uh, building consent invoices that are unpaid. It could be any fees and charges that council has raised that remains unpaid and is over that three month age. A whole range of, of things. They, it could also include property rentals that have fallen in arrears. Um, yes, and, could, yeah, property things. rentals. So there, we, there will be, I am aware of a couple of property rentals that we're working on at the moment to pull out from that category. Um, so, yeah, any arrears end up in there, other than rates. Did you hear it, Murray? Yeah, I did. Look, I was just sort of thinking, look, at other balance sheets at the moment, um, people have been working really hard on cash for the obvious reason that um, cash is, is pretty short in some businesses. And I guess being a council, you've got to be sensitive to things, but at the same time, really pick up as much as you can in terms of, of debtors um, in the fortunate position that we can rate. But um, we should be trying to pick up every dollar we can on the other side as well. It's right, pay money, that's all. There's a discipline. Good comments, thank you, Dave. Um, Councillor Fulun. Yeah, does Council actually have a policy on uh, debtors? In other words, as soon as the 90-day mark is uh, reached and the bill is still outstanding, that it's handed over to a debtor collection, or do we try and negotiate with the debtor? What is the actual policy that we have? We certainly have one with rates, um, so rates do have a process that you go through. Um, with other um, debt, we go back to generally the um, um, area that raised the debt and talk to them about whether they can um, recover it themselves, um, and so we work with them. Um, some of them are covered, especially the property ones, are covered by clauses in the lease that you can't just evict people or you know, get them out. Um, we then look at debt collectors and then we look at court. So there's a process um, that we go through. Um, it's fair to say that we probably need to tighten up that process for some categories of debtors. Um, yep. But there is certainly a process and there's certainly a one for rates that is a separate one to the others. So there are automatic letters generated and um, issues such as that. Thank you all. Some good discussions. Any more questions or comments? Just one question. Okay. The, um, we've got two graphs there of the current and the um, prior month. 
could we combine those two together to have them side by side or would it be clearer to see where the direction is heading? Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. I will um, go make sure that we can do that, but I don't see it being an issue. Yes, we do. Yep. Can I just make a comment that the question was asked what's in, sun in other revenue? One of the large items in other revenue is property rentals and leases and income is one of the ones that, that go into that category. Also, our rates, our commission we get on rates for ECAN goes into that category. So there's a whole lot of stuff, sundry income that goes in there, but one of the big items sitting in there is your commercial property income. Thank you for that, Paul. We basically are on the end on the financial variances report, and we've got a motion to receive the May 2020 financial report. We've got a mover and a seconder, please. I've got Councillor Cameron and Councillor McMillan. Everyone in favour, please say aye. 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 Most. Thank you all, councillors, staff, Murray. Uh, the com <laughs> public. public, yeah, public. Is, um, this is the end of the open meeting. We're going to have a break, and then we're going to be in. Sorry, did I? So, Mr. Chair, I'm just suggesting did you want to pass the resolution to go into public exclusion while you're still in the public meeting? Oh, yes, okay. I'll, yep. I'll move that we go. We moved it to call in. Okay, we've got to move in a second there. We go in exclusion. Everyone in favour say aye. Aye. Lunch is ready, I think. We might have a break first.